I am pleased to uh, present you um, uh, this, uh, this slideshow about uh, filtration technology and more specifically about uh, green fumut technology. Um, I will start with something very simple um, showing you when we talk about fil recirculatory uh, filtration from the board, the the first thing we've got to understand is that uh, the safety of the end user depends on two major uh, technology. The first technology is common uh, between uh, uh, recirculatory filtration film cupboard and uh, ducted uh, film cupboard. It's called containment. And the other one is specific to recirculatory filtration film cupboard. It's the ability to filter all the pollution that is emitted into the enclosure before recycling the air into the room, and it's called filtration. So, um, to be sure to be perfectly uh, protected during the operation, that's very important to, uh, to be confident into both technologies, the ability to contain and the ability to filter the air. So, first of all, about containment, as said before, uh, a, filtration, a, a filtration film cupboard must guarantee you um, an air barrier between you and the application into the room. Um, when we try to define uh, containment, I try to extract a definition onto the web and to apply it uh, to, uh, to fume mood, and it it can be defined as the action of keeping something harmful, as example, chemical vapors of particles under control within limits, the limit of the enclosure. As example, if you use a chemical on your worktop, thanks to the, uh, the air barrier, you will create a barrier between the vapors emitted by your beakers and, um, and the user. So when you use a duct tissue mood, uh, all the air that is used to create the, this air barrier is extracted from the air volume from the building thanks to the fan. With a recirculatory film cupboard, the air is not extracted from the building, it's filtered on the filters before being recycled uh, into the room. That said, uh, what we must expect from the containment of a filtration film cupboard is exactly the same than a ducted film cupboard. And that's the reason why when we talk about containment and when we test containment in our laboratory, first of all, uh, we rely to uh, um, a specific standard for recirculated film cupboard, as example, the French NFX 15211 or the BS 7989 in UK or the GGN. Uh, standard in China. But uh, when you use this standard, as example, the NFX 15211 refers directly to the EN 14175, even if EN 14175 does not apply directly to a filtration film cupboard. Uh, but the protocol that is used to uh, challenge the containment of a uh, recirculatory film cupboard is exactly the same that the one that is decri described in EN 14175 part 3 um, for the inner plane grid. In the US, when they test the containment of recirculatory film cupboard, they use also the same protocols and for ducted fumud, and they use the protocol that is described in ANSI ASHRAE 110. And there is also some exist, a specific protocol existing all over the world, as example, using uh, IPA to challenge containment. To illustrate a little bit what is expected from the containment of a recirculatory film cupboard, in France, as example, when you test it according to the, parts, uh, the um, inner, uh, inner grid uh, containment test, you must not find more than 0 0.1 ppm of SF6 on the inner grid. And in ASHRAE 110, you must not find more than 0 0.05 ppm of SF6 during this test, which is exactly the same requirements and for ductless, ductless fumes. 
when we talk also about contentment, uh, I also uh, most of the time try to talk about uh, the contentment factor, which is for me more than concentration of the SF6, the most important parameters uh, of contentment. This ratio is a ratio between uh, what is uh, emitted into the room and what is uh, uh, inhalated by the human in front of the room. That's the ratio of concentration. It gives you the ratio of pollution that is clearly trapped by the enclosure. And um, I uh, clearly um, uh, promote the idea to compare this containment factor to the risk assessment necessary before using any uh, any fumude, uh, fumude or fume cupboard ducted or filtered. So the, the second important uh, technology that is used used for recirculatory uh, filtration fume cupboard or fume hoods depending on where you are in the world, because you've got the two terms, fume wood or fume cupboard, are uh, the ability to filter. Before talking about the technology themselves, when we talk about air pollution, we've got to consider that air pollution can be um, a mix of different uh, kind of uh, pollutants. Uh, gaseous molecules, as example, liquids or solids. And with a various uh, range of size, uh, between uh, 0.1 nanometer up to one uh, millimeters. And when we talk about this pollution in laboratories, there is in fact two major technologies that are used uh, to trap uh, them. For the biggest particles, liquids or solid, we will talk about particulate filtration and it can be performed thanks to HEPA filters or UPA filters. And, but when we talk about gas or vapors, we will use um, molecular uh, filtration, also called adsorption. And most of the time, it's made with activated carbon. When we talk about particulate filtration, as said before, most of the time it's uh, made with EPA or ULPA filters. I think this year, a lot of people have been trained about uh, the definition of EPA or ULPA filters uh, thanks, thanks to the COVID-19 crisis because this technology is one of the only one available on the market to efficiently trap virus or bacteria. It is made of a network of non-woven fibers, uh, most of the time fiberglass, but it can also be used, uh, made with, um, um, sorry, uh, polymeric uh, materials and uh, this network of uh, fibers uh, can trap particles thanks to different effects, the sieve effects, the inertial mass effects, the perception effects and the diffusion, uh, the diffusion effect. Uh, to distinguish, so when you've got a sieve effect, the, the idea is that uh, you've got a space between each fibers and you trap the particles that are bigger than the space between two fibers. But when you talk about the other effects, it's also um, 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 say um, determined that this uh, network of fibers can trap particles that are smaller than the size between the fibers. That, I, that is the reason why when we trap, uh, when we test EPA or ULPA filters for particles, we, we use a very complex test that is called MPPS. It's a most permeable size distribution test where we emit a, um, a mix of particles of different size in order to try to determine the one that, can, that is the most challenges for the filters. And this is not always the smallest one. Most of the time is between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 micron. When this size of particle is uh, determined, after that we emit uh, a big mix of uh, these uh, particles in order to determine the efficiency of the filters. 
And at Terlab, as example, in our green fumut technology, we use two different uh, type of filters, the uh, H14 filters, uh, 99.995% uh, of efficiency, and the U16 uh, that are 100 times more efficient than H14. Um, you've got to remember that uh, when a uh, manufacturer claims to use HEPA filters, you've got to ask them what type of HEPA filters, because if they only use H12 filters, it's 100 times less efficient than H14. Um, that said, um, at the beginning of the presentation, I talked a little bit about uh, containment. When you use H14 filters, you can uh, estimate that the H14 filters is two times or three times more efficient than the containment of, uh, of, the, um, of the enclosure. That, that means that if there is any risk of leakage, most of the time is due to the uh, containment or the phase velocity and never to the filters because the filters are much more efficient than the containment itself when we talk about particles. I forget to say, sorry, uh, that the standard that is used to determine EPA and ULPA filters is the uh, EN uh, 1822, but there is also an, a standard in the US, very equivalent. You will see that there is slight um, small differences between, uh, uh, between uh, the efficiency according to American standard and EN standard, but they are very similar. When we talk about gas and vapors, uh, we cannot use a network of fibers to trap them because the gas are too small to be trapped. In that case, uh, we will use a chemical reaction to trap uh, gas and vapors. And this chemical reaction is called adsorption. The idea is to uh, create a reaction between a mix of polluted air, pollution plus uh, ammonium, um, plus um, nitrogen, plus oxygen, uh, mixed with a material that will absorb the pollution. At the end of the reaction, we will uh, absorb uh, the pollution on the surface of the material. And most of the time, the material that is used for adsorption is activated carbon. As any uh, chemical reaction, there is also a reverse reaction that is called desorption. And that's clear. When we talk about filtration film cupboard, we must select a material that will, on one side, allow a large amount of adsorption, but also must avoid any risk of desorption. In order to understand how we avoid this, you've got to understand how adsorption works and also how activity carbon uh, or activity charcoal is made. First of all, adsorption. Adsorption is not only, in, not only one type of chemical reaction, but is in fact a mix of different chemical reaction. And there is two families of uh, adsorption. The first one is called physical adsorption. Uh, it's also sometimes uh, called reversible adsorption. And it's very comparable to surface condensation, and it's powered by Van der Waals forces. Um, but uh, most of the time, uh, it's called reversible reaction because when you perform this reaction on silica, as example, it's very easy to adsorb, but also very easy to desorb when you use physical adsorption. But I have shown during my uh, PhD that, that when you use activity charcoal, uh, and if you manage correctly uh, the distance between the pores of activated carbon, you can perform physical adsorption without any risk of desorption. That said, 
I would say call it physical adsorption and don't call it reversible adsorption, which is a mistake when you talk about activated carbons that are used in our products. That said, physical adsorption is very useful uh, to trap uh, unpolar solvents, but it's less efficient to trap polar molecules. And that's the reason why when we talk about adsorption, we've got also to define a second type of uh, adsorption called chemisorption. And during chemisorption, um, the reaction is different. We create chem chemical bonds between pollution and the surface of the material and activated charcoal. And in that case, uh, there is uh, no risk of desorption at all. But whatever, when you want to trap a mix of VOCs, that's very important to achieve both type of adsorption, physical and chemical adsorption. That's the time where I've got to talk about my grandmother. Uh, that's uh, because my grandmother uh, was a chemist without knowing she was a chemist. Uh, during uh, the Second World War, she told me that she she, wa she washed her, uh, her clothes with charcoal. And uh, when I was kid, I was very impressed about that, or with sanders. And my, my grandmother performed adsorption without knowing that it was adsorption uh, because uh, sanders or um, ashes, sorry, not sanders, ashes or uh, charcoal, charcoal, they are made of carbon atoms, 90 or 95 percent of carbon atoms. And in charcoal, in graphite or in diamond, carbon atoms are very well organized, uh, the one with the others. Uh, each carbon atom is uh, linked to the other atom in the same plan, and uh, each layer of charcoal uh, sheets is uh, linked to the other thanks to chemical bonds. It gives to the material a very special um, surface energy, uh, very unstable, and this surface energy tends to attract other chemicals to absorb them on the surface. Uh, this is very well known and has been used uh, for many centuries for these properties. And at the beginning of the 20th century or at the end of the 19th century, some researchers have developed activity carbon from charcoal. And the principle is to use charcoal samples to heat them at very high temperature, uh, 1,800 Fahrenheit, let's say 900 uh, Celsius degrees, in order to, um, to create a popcorn reaction between the layers of carbons and to create a porous structure in um, the carbon gram. So before activation, a carbon uh, charcoal can develop a surface of about uh, 50 uh, square meters per um, per gram. At the end of activation, uh, some activated carbon can develop up to 1,500 uh, square meters per gram, which is a huge um, a huge reaction. And if you calculate the surface developed by the activity charcoal that is embedded into the biggest uh, green fumut technology, uh, the total surface of, um, of the carbon is almost equal to the surface of the island of Manhattan. I don't know um, uh, in China or uh, in France, what size of city it could be, but probably the size of the inner size of Paris downtown. And all this surface is available to trap uh, gas and vapors to attract them thanks to physisorption or chemisorption. Whatever, what I gave you is uh, the definition of activated carbon, but does not mean that there is only one type of activated carbon. In fact, there is many, many different types of activated carbon depending on 
what you will do with the activated carbon. First of all, you can choose different types of uh, rough material to, to produce your activity charbon charcoal. You can use miner mineral uh, charcoal, you can use wood, or you can use, as what we do, coconut shell to produce the activated carbon. And after that, you've got the recipe to produce the activated charcoal. Uh, the temperature you will use to burn. If you, you can also use some chemicals to activate, it, to activate it, the charcoal in order to open more or less the porous structure of charcoal. A normal, a, a standard activity charcoal um, can trap uh, organic solvents with molecular weight of or oh, higher than 30 grams per mole and um, uh, oh, sorry um, oh sorry a temperature of vaporization of 60 uh, uh, Celsius degrees. As said before, there is a lot of different activated charcoal uh, that are made for different applications. And clearly, you must be careful not to use the same activated charcoal for gas mask or for solvent recovery or water treatment. And that's a mistake that is uh, very uh, common. Uh, people think that activity carbon uh, or activity charcoal is only one type. No, there is many, many different types. And as an example, um, as example, uh, charcoal for solvent recovery is prepared um, in order to maximize the size of the pore, in order to uh, trap as much solvent as possible. But when you want to perform solvent recovery, you want to adsorb, but also you want to have the ability to desorb in order to reuse the solvent. And when you do that, most of the people use uh, mineral charcoal with large pore uh, in order to minimize the energy needed to uh, desorb. By contrast, when you want to produce an activity charcoal for recirculatory film carbon, you must be very careful in order to manage uh, a good balance between the amount of chemicals you want to trap, but also in order to avoid the risk of desorption. And that's where AirLab is an expert. Uh, we've got this ability to prepare very uh, specialized and very technical activity charcoal that are dedicated to filtration film cupboard. And we are the only one, one in the world to perform this way. Also on the market, you can find some activity carbons that are modified in order to make them more specific to uh, certain kinds of application. I told you that a normal activity carbon that is activated in order to trap uh, solvents is limited because it cannot trap uh, solvents with molecular weight lower than uh, 30 grams per mole. But it's also possible to pre-adsorb on the surface a chemical that will react with the chemicals that, that are not easily adsorbed by activated charcoal. And this pre-adsorption is called impregnation of activated charcoal. That has been very uh, commonly used uh, um, since um, about uh, 30, 40 years. But there is one reverse effect of impregnation. When you do that, you make the carbon more specific for certain kind of uh, chemicals that are not easy to trap, as example for ammonia or acids. But at the same time, you minimize the ability to trap other chemicals. Another um, negative effect of impregnation is that many, many impregnated carbons on the market are impregnated with uh, heavy metals. And I just want to let you know that uh, uh, Air Lab do not use any heavy metals at all. Um, um, all activated carbons that are sold by AirLab are guaranteed with no heavy metals at all. That's very important to remind that. Uh, 
So, um, this strategy to produce a carbon from coconut shell and specialized activity carbon um, has uh, defined the first range of activity carbon that are used in our um, capter smart range of filtration film cupboard with four types of carbon the AS carbon for organic solvents, the B plus uh, for acid and organic solvent and both AS and B plus um, carbon are not impregnated at all. There is no impregnation on them. And we've got two impregnated carbon, one which is specific for formaldehyde and another one that is specific for ammonia and amines. So these um, uh, carbons are perfectly ad adapted if you know exactly what you will use in your fume mood. But we also know that in some laboratories, people are not, uh, do, does not precisely know what they will do in their fume mood. And that's, a re that what, uh, the reason why we launched about 10 years ago, the first generation of uh, Neutrodyne filters and two years ago, the second generation called Neutrodyne Unisorb, which is the first universal activity carbon uh, filters. So the main difference with the standard activity carbon um, used uh, or the other types of activity carbon used at Turlab is that this one is made with uh, very well selected coconut shell and with a very precise activation process to be uh, to develop a porous structure that is um, organized a way to trap light organic solvents up to very heavy organic solvents, mineral uh, acids or ammonia on the same carbon. This is a, an exclusive ELA process uh, which is only available on uh, green fume technology. So, sorry, uh, yeah, I just reopen all the information. So, at our lab, we pay attention. Uh, to use the correct recipe to prepare uh, the appropriate activity carbon for different type of application from a dedicated activity carbon for the capture smart up to universal activity carbons for neutrodyne unisorb and gfh but uh, in order to ensure that uh, it's very important to perform a very strict and very stringent uh, quality control this quality control is performed at different steps uh, during production of activity carbon and at each step of uh, filters manufacturing at our lab uh, facility. And for that, we follow different uh, American standard um, uh, protocol, uh, particle size distribution, ball pan hardness, apparent density, uh, butane working capacity, butane activity. But also, we have developed our own protocol to challenge the appropriate parameters of each activity carbon. That said, um, activity carbon is not enough to guarantee uh, an excellent or uh, sufficient performance of the filters. The design of the filters is as important as uh, the material itself. Um, the contact time between the pollution, um, the thickness of the activity carbon bed, um, also the pre-filtration, the post-filtration, the air tightness of the filters are parameters uh, that you must uh, manage the same way you manage activity carbon. And to give you an example, here we've got two breakthrough curves use uh, obtained with the same amount of carbon with the same uh, flow rate, the same concentration of alpha-seton before the filters 
but uh, that are obtained with filters that is uh, correctly designed and a filter that is not correctly designed. And you can see that with the same amount of carbon, uh, with small differences of design, you've got a difference of retention capacity of about um, uh, one for four. So uh, we are uh, we pay a lot of attention to containment, to filtration, but also that said, um, filter monitor monitoring or air quality monitoring is also a very important parameter. There is nothing in a fumut that tells you that no chemical is exhausted from the fumut. But when you use uh, green fumut, uh, green fumut embeds. Uh, sensors that guarantee you that all the air that recycle, recycle into the room is free of pollution. So these um, sensors are located between a primary filter uh, here called uh, uh, primary neutraline unisorb and a backup neutraline unisorb. The reason why we located these sensors between uh, these two layers of filters is that when a detector sends a pollution after the primary filters, the backup filter is still there in order to avoid any leakage of pollution into the room. So in GFH, uh, we use a network of three different sensors. Uh, the first one is a semiconductor that is used in order to monitor a large variety of VOCs. It's very, very sensitive. And I would say that for most of application, this sensor is sufficient because um, it reacts each time there is a VOC in the room and it, it has got a sensitivity at very, very low concentration. But uh, at the same time, it's, uh, it's sensitive to acid, but there is a risk to, to damage it with acid. That's the reason why we combined it with um, a sensor for acids and an optional sensor for um, formaldehyde. So, and the combination of these three sensors allows to know exactly what exhaust what is exhausted or to guarantee that the air that is exhausted from the primary filter is free of pollution. All these sensors have been tested for five years in our laboratory with a very stringent protocol in a closed chamber uh, emitting uh, every day a mix of pollution in the um, in the chamber and in order to know exactly how the sensors react when they face pollution, mix of pollution, and uh, knowing how they react depending on temperature and humidity. And here you've got an example of a reaction curves for acetone. So we have tested hundreds and hundreds of chemicals. For sure, we cannot test all the chemicals existing in laboratories, but we selected some references, and with these references, we can also easily determine how other chemicals can react. And here you've got the example for alcohol. So we tested methanol, ethanol, propanol, or pentanol. And that, knowing the reaction of these chemicals with uh, these four uh, solvents, we uh, can also easily determine uh, the reaction for butanol and hexanol. And here we, we've got the same with butane, pentane, hexane, all the alkanes. So when you buy a filtration film cupboard, it's also very important to refer to standards. And that's the reason why we highly recommend to refer to the three uh, uh, standards that are displayed on the screen, the NFX15211 in France, the BS7989 in UK, and the GJT3852212 uh, uh, in China.
the principle of all these standards are exactly uh, the same. So uh, they challenge the containment of um, of the fumoods, they challenge the filters uh, in order to grant it to the end user a certain efficiency. And in the NFX 15 to 11 and in the shiny standard, uh, that's where the um, uh, requirements are the higher, higher. NFX 15 to 11 and GJT uh, standards require concentration at the filter exhaust lower than 1% of the TLV of the products. That means that for all the retention capacity of the filter, you must not find at filter exhaust most uh, more than 1% of the maximum load concentration uh, for the user. So that is a very, very stringent uh, requirement. So the target of each standard are all the same, as said before, filtration requirement, containment requirement for filtration, and also documentation. Uh, all the few moods that uh, comply to the standard must be sticked with uh, a sticker referring to the standard. And I also recommend you to ask to manufacturer to provide you um, certificate of test by third party. And as example at Third Air Lab, all our products are tested by Entertech and Airflux Concept uh, for containment and filtration. There is also additional uh, requirements in the Chinese and French standard. Um, each fumoud must be uh, delivered with the list of chemicals that can be used in the fumoud. So, uh, as a conclusion, so uh, today you can find on the market um, recirculative fume cup boards. Uh, that I'm not afraid to say that are probably safer than any other uh, fumoud on the market, thanks to uh, filtration technology that are uh, improved and challenged with, with very stringent tests, and sensing technology uh, that can detect most of the pollutants that are released. I just want to remind you that you will find sensors that monitor air quality in filtered fumoud. And there is no sensor that monitor air quality when you use a ducted fumoud. So it means that you know more about your safety with recirculative fume cupboard than with any other fumoud. Okay, uh, that's probably now time for question, if there is. Uh, first question from Nancy de Guzman. Um, what is the required frequency of change for the carbon filters? Ah. That's a very good, a very good question. Um, so um, I did not talk about retention capacities. Uh, each carbon filter has got its own properties, um, and a retention capacity for each chemical. As an example, and it's not uh, accurate, but. Uh, uh, we've got some filters with, um, I think for IPA, uh, we can trap about uh, 600 grams of IPA per filter. So the uh, lifetime of this filter, if you use IPA, will depend of the um, amount of IPA that is generated every day by your application. And that's the reason why before, um, before uh, any recommendation of recirculatory film cupboard, we propose to our customer to perform a quick risk assessment when we pre-estimate uh, the speed of evaporation of uh, their chemical in their fume mood in order to estimate the filter's lifetime. And when we recommend a filtered fume cupboard, we only recommend when we are sure to achieve more than six months. And the average uh, uh, lifetime of filters that we observe on field is 18 months. Uh, correct, Sabine? Sorry. I, uh, yes, absolutely uh, right. Uh, the average and the maximum lifetime of the green fume hood uh, Neutrodyne Uniserve is 48 months. 
Uh, this uh, leads me to a second question, which is related to this. You mentioned the risk assessment. Uh, what happens if there is any change in the application of the uh, the, the, the manipulation? What what happens? Uh, what is the procedure uh, when we make a first risk assessment and recommend a film hood, a ductless uh, film cupboard, after uh, this um, this change? So um, what we offer to our customers is to call us back and to reperform a risk assessment each time they, they've got a big modification of their application. And that's for free. So uh, uh, we, we deliver and we propose for free uh, as much um, risk assessment as you want uh, with our chemical uh, expert at the disposal of customers. Um, now a question about the calibration process of the filtration. So this question is from Sujet Power. Uh, is calibration process the same for a filtration film hood as compared to a regular ducted film hood? No, it's it's not exactly the same. Uh, when you when you talk about calibration, I think you talk about um, qualification after installation or routine qualification. Um, so, um, normally uh, with a ducted film mood, you focus on uh, phase velocities and containment. With record circulatory film cupboard, it's the same. You've got to, to check the containment, and for that, you've got specific uh, protocol uh, with IPA, as example, that can be used. Uh, you've got also to perform phase velocity measurements. But at the same time, uh, it is highly recommend to challenge the filters. If you've got a uh, uh, filter for solvents, as an example, you will emit small amounts of solvents in the fume mode and monitor if it passes through the filters. And if you've got uh, particulate filters, there are also way to challenge them with uh, particles. But it's highly recommended to, to do that um, in addition with uh, classic tests for ducted fume modes. Okay, and how frequently is uh, recommended this uh, validation or uh, check of the uh, fume hood? Minimum, mi minimum is one time a year. Uh, that's what we recommend. Uh, um, according to the to the regulation in France, that's what what is done in France. Uh, I would say it's reasonable to do it uh, one time a year. But if your risk assessment have shown that you will saturate um, the filters uh, earlier than one year, it's also feasible to do it more uh, frequently or uh, by, uh, by contrast, if you've got a very long filters lifetime, well, maybe uh, you can do it every two years. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we have here a very precise question from Kate Warilo. Uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, would using solvents such as eptane prolong the lifetime of the filters when compared to pentane? Or would this application be better suited to a ducted film hood? Now, um, for certain kinds of carbon, I would say yes, but it really depends on the activated carbon you use. Uh, with um, with the activated carbon, uh, with uh, as a neutronine unisorb filters, uh, the difference between light solvent and um, heavy solvent is not uh, as big as uh, big than uh, with classical activated carbon. Um, so we have enlarged uh, a lot uh, retention capacity for light uh, solvents. Okay. Um, another question uh, from uh, Marie Fiantonia. Uh, when, and that's a good question, when do you recommend the ductless film hood or the ducted film hood? Basically, well, how to choose between ductless film hood and ducted film hood? Uh, I would say first, it's not one against the others. Uh, you've got a toolbox and you need uh, all the tools together, collaborating together. Um, I would say only risk assessment can tell you uh, when. Uh, if you've got large amount of solvents, you need ducted, uh, ducted fume hood uh, for sure. Uh, if you cannot control your evaporation at all, uh, you need ducted. But at the same time, if you need um, 
I would say protection at each square meter of your laboratory. Uh, you, I clearly recommend you to have also filtered fumood or recirculated fume cupboard. I would say risk assessment is the beginning uh, to determine what to use. Okay, and uh, when filters are uh, saturated, what what should we do with them? This is a question from Bish Shadu. So, it depends on the country, uh, country and regulation. In Europe, it's um, uh, classified uh, West uh, 180202, and it gave us. Uh, uh, the right uh, to incinerate it at high temperature, and that what is done with uh, uh, collaboration, thanks to collaboration with Veolia in France, as example. Uh, but for that, you've got to to check with uh, local regulation. But incineration is most of the time what is used to destroy filters. Um, how often the new unit needs to um, undergo sensor cal calibration for detection of pollutants? Oh, that's a good question. But um, in fact, uh, we we calibrate them with, before we install them into um, into the unit. And what we recommend is not a calibration because uh, calibration is uh, expensive. But we recommend to change them. We uh, we monitor their um, their variation depending on time and for um, uh, VOC sensors, uh, molecular health sensor, we recommend to change them every five years. And for uh, molecular A for acid and uh, F for formaldehyde, we recommend to change them every two years. It, but there is no, calibra no calibration on site. Okay. Um, and uh, when, uh, so I have more questions for you, Cédric. Um, one from Bisha Deo again. Is there any opportunity to rejuvenate the used carbon filters? No. It's not due to the carbon, uh, to the carbon itself, but each of our customers uh, use different chemicals. So, uh, and it's not possible to adapt a recycling process to such large variety of uh, uh, of waste. That's the reason why if you try to recycle, it does not work. It's uh, too expensive and might be too dangerous to try to recycle. Okay. Uh, one question from Lucy Lee. Why K filter expiry date is short? One year. Um, because uh, when you want to trap ammonia, you, you, you've got to prepare um, a carbon with uh, more ability for chemical adsorption. And uh, when you do that, it's very, it attracts ammonia, but it also attracts a lot of water. And water can uh, limit adsorption and reaction. So we estimate that after one year, there is a risk to have too much water to guarantee a correct performance of the filters themselves. 